So now we're embarking on a whole chapter of what's called stoichiometry. And stoichiometry is just a funny sounding word that really just deals with the relationship between the amounts of reactants consumed and the products created in a chemical reaction. Now central to this concept is going to be the idea of a mole. And a mole is just a number. And in this case, it turns out it's Avogadro's number, but let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Now this lesson's part of my high school chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these throughout the 2020-21 school year, so if you don't want to miss a lesson, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications, you'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. calculations involving moles, what we're going to deal with in this lesson. But before we get there, though, I want to deal with something a little more familiar. So one of the great educational psychologists said that the most important thing when you're teaching is what your students already know. And so the, the art of a good teacher is to relate, you know, what you're teaching them to something they already know, because that way they've got a place in their knowledge framework to put it. And so before we talk about moles, I just want to talk about dozens. Now, you know what a dozen is? It's a number. If I say, go buy me a dozen eggs, you know, go buy me 12 eggs and things of a sort, because a dozen is just a number. If I say, you know, go get two dozen donuts, you know, you're going to be going and getting me 24 donuts. And these are things you do in your head, hopefully, at this stage of the game and stuff like that. But before we talk about moles, I want to talk about dozens because it is something you know. And then we'll see that moles is an analogous concept with just a much larger number. So a few questions I want to answer. So if you've got 24 baseballs, So the question is, how many dozen baseballs do you have? And obviously you can see that 24 baseballs is two dozen. You're probably doing that in your head, but while you can do this in your head, if I give you numbers or in, in the case of moles in a little bit, a number that's really ugly. So, you know, it's something you can't really see in your head or do calculations within your head. You're going to want to understand how this process works. So to convert the, the number of baseballs here to dozens of baseballs, I want the number of baseballs in the denominator. So it'll cancel. And I want dozens of baseballs in the numerator. So, and one dozen baseballs is 12 baseballs. And so we've got an equality here, and this is another example of dimensional analysis. We did this with units and conversions back in the first chapter. So, but the baseballs will cancel here, and now we see that 24 divided by 12 guts us our two dozen baseballs. Okay, so that's the formal process here. So here we're converting from baseballs to dozens of baseballs, and you can go the other way as well. In fact, uh, we want to take this one other place, though, as well, dealing with weights. So if the weight of one dozen baseballs is 1.8 kilograms, then what is the weight of two dozen baseballs? And so there's a conversion here. So we can start with our two dozen, and I'll just call it BB for baseballs. So we can start with our two dozen baseballs, and we want to know how much it weighs. Well, if one dozen weighs 1.8 kilograms, well, then two dozen would weigh double that. And again, probably something you're doing in your head. And so you just take two times 1.8 kilograms, and you get 3.6 kilograms, and life is good. But again, I want you to kind of understand the process, because if you learn the process with things you can do in your head, then when you get to things that you can't do in your head, and you know the process, you'll be in much better shape. So in this case, we know that one dozen baseballs equals 1.8 kilograms. And that's actually as far as I want to go here. And so in this case, we just do two times 1.8 and get our 3.6 kilograms. So that's again, how we're using our dimensional analysis to kind of carry this out. So now let's take this one step further. Last question in this section. So if the weight of one dozen baseballs is again, 1.8 kilograms, what is the weight of 72 baseballs? And so in this case, first thing you want to do is take your 72 baseballs and figure out how many dozen that is, because you know the weight of a dozen baseballs. You don't know the weight of one baseball. I mean, you could figure it out and do it that way as well. So, but it wouldn't be analogous to what we're going to study in a little bit. So in this case, first thing you want to do is figure out how many dozen this is. And because you know that one dozen weighs 1.8 kilograms. So however many dozen you have, multiply that by 1.8 kilograms per dozen. So in this case, we'll take that one dozen baseballs is 12 baseballs. And once again, this will cancel. And we'll now have dozens of baseballs. And we'll see that 72 corresponds to six dozen if we're keeping tabs along the way. So, but we didn't want to stop there. We actually wanted to convert this to a weight. And so we know that one dozen baseballs weighs 1.8 kilograms. And once again, get some dimensional analysis, those will cancel. And now we could get that weight. And so in this case, 72 divided by 12 shows me that I have six dozen. 
And six dozen times 1.8 kilograms per dozen is gonna get us our answer. So in this case, you might use a calculator. I'm gonna do this in my head. So six dozen, six times one is still six. Six times 0.8 is 4.8. And six plus 4.8 should give us 10.8 kilograms. Cool, there's your answer. So these are analogous to some of the calculations we're gonna see here in a little bit, but instead of dealing with baseballs, we're gonna deal with like atoms and molecules and things of this sort. So this video just got a lot better because I'm bringing coffee into this video. Coffee pretty much makes anything better, including this video. So in this case, we're gonna talk about the mole and a mole is a number and it's called Avogadro's number. And in this case, it is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So, and if you look at that scientific notation, that is a ginormous number. So again, you'd have to move this decimal to the right 23 places, 602, oh, 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 It's bigger than anything you can think of. If you think about like, you know, the US national debt being like 20 some odd trillion, that is not even close to this number. So way bigger than a trillion. In fact, it's almost a trillion trillions. It's huge. It is a ginormous number. And this is commonly the number we're gonna use a lot in chemistry here. And the reason being is that atoms and molecules are really small. So this coffee here, in addition to the coffee, it's really mostly water most of the water molecules in here. And in here, there's truth be told, probably somewhere on the order of like, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 moles of water molecules, a ginormous. And the idea is that atoms and molecules are so teeny tiny that we have to deal with a very huge number of them before we can actually touch and taste and see it and stuff like that. All right, so let's put that coffee away. All right, so no more coffee. All right, so going back to this mole here, and again, it's just a huge number. So, and again, the idea is that we have to have that kind of a number to have you know enough molecules or atoms that we can touch or taste or see or, or, or measure or something like this. So if I told you I had a million gold atoms in the palm of my hand, am I rich? Well, no, a million gold atoms is not even large enough for me to see. What about a billion? What about a trillion? Even with a trillion gold atoms in my hand, that's not a sample size that's big enough for you to even see with your eyes. I'm not rich. So, but what if I told you I had a mole of gold atoms? Well, all of a sudden now that is a sample size that you could see. It's big enough that we could actually see it and, and handle it and things of a sort and weigh it as we'll see in things of a sort. And so that's why we use this big number right here. So, because all the other big numbers, you know, we normally would deal with in trillions and billions and stuff. They're just not big enough when it comes to teeny tiny atoms and molecules um, for them to be amounts that we could play with. So that's kind of the deal. So you should realize that a mole is just a number, but it's a number that's not going to come up in any other context outside of chemistry. You know, I wouldn't say, hey, go to the store and get me a mole of donuts. Obviously, that would be ridiculous. If you look and, and say, well, what would a mole of donuts look like? Well, a mole of donuts, if you wanted to kind of visualize this. So think about going into outer space from like the moon and looking back at the earth and seeing just donuts. You don't see an earth, you just see donuts. So, because that's what a mole of donuts would be like. It would be some ginormous volume of donuts that would envelop the earth. And you know, you maybe even get back out to Pluto and you might just see a big ball of donuts somewhere instead of seeing the earth. It would be a crazy number of donuts. Not that many donuts exist in the universe kind of a thing, you know? So it's, it's not a number you're gonna encounter in any other context except when talking about atoms and molecules in, the, in chemistry. So you might talk about a dozen eggs and a dozen donuts and you use dozen a different, you know, a whole bunch of different contexts, but that's not gonna be the case with mole. And because it's such a ginormous number, a number that we really just can't conceptualize in our minds, it often pro you know, provides a little confusion and stuff. So, but I wanted to be in your head first off that a mole is just a number. So let's start with this. And let's say you've got two, dozen donuts. And the question is then how many donuts do you have? And this is again, analogous to what we've seen here. Well, two dozen donuts. So one dozen donuts is 12 donuts. And so you should have 24 donuts here. Okay. Again, relating to something that's easier to see. Now, what if you had two moles of donuts instead of two dozen. So two moles of donuts. Again, if one mole of donuts is a ginormous number that would fill the earth, well then two moles of donuts would be twice as many. And again, how many donuts actually is this? Well, again, one mole of anything, including donuts, is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of whatever you're talking about. In this case, 
donuts. Now, obviously, again, we would never really use this number in talking about donuts, but I'm using it as an example here. So we'll get rid of our moles of donuts, and now we'll see that we've got 12.04 times 10 to the 23rd donuts. And this is not proper scientific notation. If you wanted to do proper scientific notation, you'd have to move that decimal back one, and it would be 1.204 times 10 to the 24th donuts. Cool, but a ginormous number. And again, it's the same exact setup, if you notice, the same exact kind of calculation, but it's with a term, the mole, that you're not as familiar with as a dozen. It's a term that you won't use in any other context outside of chemistry, and it's just a huge number. But it really is as simple as dealing with the dozen, except when you get to the math of it. All right, so let's say you have 3.01. times 10 to the 23rd donuts. So you've got a big, big number of donuts. But now the question is, how many moles of donuts do you have? So now we're going the other way. Instead of just starting with moles and going to the absolute number of donuts, now we're starting with the absolute number of donuts and trying to get to moles of donuts. And so just like if we were converting this to dozens and we divide by 12, well now one mole of donuts is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd donuts. And once again, our units here will cancel. We'll end up with moles of donuts for the units of the answer here. And you can see that this is exactly half of this number. And so this is exactly 0.5 moles of donuts. Cool. And again, I'm starting with donuts here, something a little more tangible, but Obviously from here on out, we're gonna be doing this with pretty much molecules and atoms and things of that sort. So a minute ago, we had two moles of donuts. Now we got two moles of carbon. And just like when I had two moles of donuts, I wanna know how many donuts that was. Well, if I've got two moles of carbon atoms, how many carbon atoms is that? And the process will be exactly the same. So on the bottom, we want moles of carbon. On the top, we just want the absolute number of carbon atoms. And one mole, again, is always 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd here of whatever you're talking about, donuts, carbon atoms, whatever, so great. And in this case, our moles will cancel and we'll get 12.04 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms. Or again, in proper scientific notation, 1.204 times 10 to the 24th carbon atoms. Cool. And then just a moment ago, we had 3.01 times 10 to the 23rd donuts, and we wanted to know how many moles of donuts it was, and we figured out that it was half a mole, 0.5 moles of donuts. Well, same thing here. I've got 3.01 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms now, and I want to know how many moles of carbon atoms that is. And it'll come out exactly the same, and the process will be totally analogous. And so in this case, I've got carbon atoms in the numerator, so I'll put carbon atoms in the denominator. I'll put moles of carbon atoms or just moles of carbon, we could say, in the top. And one mole is always 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of whatever you're talking about. And once again, our units will cancel, carbon atoms, carbon atoms, and we'll end up with moles. And 3.01 times 10 to the 23rd divided by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd shows us that we have exactly half a mole of carbon or half a mole of carbon atoms. You could say it either way. So now we're gonna deal with what are called atomic weights or formula weights. And uh, these atomic weights or the weight of an atom is what's published on your periodic table. And so if you're ever trying to correspond a particular weight to a atom or molecule or compound, I should say, uh, that's where you look. You look at that periodic table and that periodic table is always your connection there. So I'm just gonna get it right off there. So like if you take a look at carbon on the periodic table, so you'll find out that carbon has an atomic weight of 12.01 AMUs. And they invented a new unit specifically for this purpose. So a single little teeny tiny carbon atom that's so small you can't see it weighs 12.01 atomic mass units. They invented a unit for this purpose. And we'll see, kind of see why they did that in a little bit. So if we take this a little further, now if you want to look at a compound, a compound's going to have what's called a formula weight. If that compound happens to be a molecular compound like water, we could also call it a molecular weight. So, but if it's an ionic compound, a compound that's not molecular, well then you can't call it a molecular weight, you just can only call it a formula weight. So here, whether we call it formula weight or molecular weight, same diff, but here it's just a formula weight it's just simply adding up all the atoms in the formula right off the periodic table. 
And so for water, if you look at hydrogen, hydrogen is going to be uh, essentially 1.0 uh, or 1.008 or 1.01, depending on uh, the number of decimal places you see on the uh, uh, your particular periodic table and stuff like that. And if you look at oxygen, oxygen might be listed as like 16.00, or you might see some that carry more decimal places like 15.9994, things of this sort. So what I do most of the time is I just round it to, you know, the nearest whole number if all of my atomic weights are close to a whole number. Now, if they're not, I usually carry it a little further. Now, for your class, and you just want to listen to what your teacher recommends. If your teacher says, carry all the decimal places that are on the periodic table that we use, well, then by all means, carry all the decimal places. But you'll find out that in a lot of my calculations, I will round it to the nearest whole number when, again, all the atomic weights that comprise a molecule or uh, ionic compound, uh, when they actually are all close to a whole number, as is the case here. So hydrogen, again, 1.01, oxygen, right around 16. And so in this case, 16 plus 1 plus one, since there's two hydrogens, is going to give us 18 AMUs. And again, if we went and carried this out a little more exact, it might be 18.02 AMUs, which is 18's unit kind of good enough for government work, as we, as we might say. If we take this to NaCl and go a little further, now this one's going to be a little more complicated. So Sodium's 22.99, so right around 23. But chlorine's a funky one. He's not right near a whole number. He's 35.45 AMUs. He's closer to 35 and a half, if you will. And so when that's the case, I usually recommend students take it at least to, you know, one more decimal place. Get one decimal place in there instead of just rounding to the nearest whole number. Things of this sort. So, but in this case, you just take 22.99 plus 35.45. And if I carried it to one decimal place, I might find that it's 58.5. Or in this case, I'm going to go 58, actually 58.4, my bad. But I'm just going to round this, or I'm going to take this exact and round it to two decimal places, 58.44 AMUs. And so because this is not coming out really close to a whole number, that's why we carried it out. And whether you took it to 58.4 or 58.44, either one of those would be far superior than just rounding it to 58. So again, if this doesn't come out close to a whole number, you probably shouldn't round it. And it didn't come out close to a whole number because chlorine's atomic mass is not really close to a whole number. All right, last one. This, it turns out, is the formula for glucose, and I want his formula weight. And in this case, we've got six carbons. And so, uh, but it turns out carbon, hydrogen, oxygen all have atomic weights that are close to a whole number. Carbon at 12.01, hydrogen at 1.01, oxygen at 16.00. So I'm just going to round them to 12, 1, and 16. But in this case, we're going to have to take 6 times 12 for the carbon, plus 12 times the 1 for the hydrogen, plus 6 times... 16 for the oxygens. And if we add this up, we get 72 right here, plus another 12 here. And here we get another 96. And if you add that all up, you're going to get 180 AMUs. All right. So one glucose molecule here, this is a molecular compound, weighs 180 AMUs. Now, again, dealing with a single molecule uh, or a single formula in the case of an ionic compound is not always the most convenient. And so oftentimes, uh, we use a different unit. We use the mole as well. And it turns out they, they actually defined this atomic mass unit in very convenient terms, as we'll see. So now in this case, I want the molar mass of C6H12O6 instead. And molar mass is not the same thing as molecular weight. So glucose's molecular weight or formula weight is 180 AMUs, but his molar mass would be the, the mass of an entire mole, not just the mass of one molecule, but the mass of 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. And what's nice is that also matches the same number on the periodic table. So, but instead of having units of 180 AMUs, it's gonna be 180 grams. And that's your difference between molecular weight and molar mass. Molecular weight's gonna be in AMUs and it's for a single molecule. Molar mass is for an entire mole of molecules. And so in this case, coming out a little bit different here, but notice the same number wise, and that's because they define the AMU in a special way. And it turns out that they defined it such that 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd AMUs equals one gram. So that little tiny unit was defined just in such a way that whether I'm talking about molecular weight or molar mass, the number part of it is exactly the same. And so that's kind of the way they did this. If we were to talk about the weight of one molecule, but in grams and not AMUs, we'd be like, well, if a one, you know, whole mole of them weighs 180 grams, well, then I would divide this by Avogadro's number to figure out what one little molecule weighs, but divide this by Avogadro's number and it would be a super tiny number and it would suck to have to use super tiny numbers. It's much easier to, instead of using that super tiny number, just say that one molecule weighs 180 of this new unit we made up called the AMU. There you go. 
All right, so now we're going to dive in a little more with calculations involving moles. There's a famous phrase that says that all roads lead, not to Rome, but to Moleville. And so what that really is referring to is the fact that a lot of the calculations we do in this section all go through moles. So you can calculate to moles, you can calculate from moles, but if you have a calculation that's not involving moles and you want to start like over here and get to here, you probably have to go through moles to complete the calculation. So if we look at one mole of carbon atoms, my first question for you is how many carbon atoms is that? So and you might recall that one mole of anything is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of whatever, in this case, carbon atoms. But my next question would be like, what does one mole of carbon atoms weigh? So notice it's a different question. And because of the periodic table, because somebody published the weight of one mole of every kind of atom, we know exactly how much they weigh. And so the problem though, is that now there's this connection between not only moles and how many, because that's the definition of what a mole is, but also as long as it's on the periodic table, there's a, you know, a, a relationship between moles and its mass. And in this case, one mole of carbon atoms weighs 12 grams. Now, because there's these two relationships, students, again, with these big numbers and what a mole is, often get these confused and they'll think about it backwards and they'll say, how many carbon atoms are in a mole? And instead of giving me Avogadro's number, they'll say 12 grams. And then I'll say, well, how much does one mole of carbon atoms weigh? And instead of giving me the weight, they'll say 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And they're trying to memorize a process, but not actually understanding what they're doing. And, and so it's kind of like if, you know, you said, hey, Chad, how much do you weigh? And I said, 175 pounds. That would be a great answer. But if you said, Chad, how much do you weigh? And I said, 44 years old. That would be a really weird answer. And if you said, hey, Chad, how old are you? And I said, 175 pounds. That, again, I'm mixing my questions. I'm answering a totally different question than the one you're answering. Same kind of thing here. Again, if I said, you have one mole of carbon atoms, how many atoms is it? And if instead of giving me the number of atoms, you told me the weight of the atoms, well, you've answered a totally different question. And I just want you to realize that, that when you're doing these calculations, I want you to not only memorize a process, but have it make sense to you as well. So, but there is a connection between moles and the number of atoms or molecules and moles and grams that you get from the periodic table. And again, the connection between moles and the number of atoms or molecules is always Avogadro's number. But the connection between moles and grams is always your molar mass right off the periodic table. So for example, let's say I told you that I had 24 grams of carbon atoms. And my question for you is how many atoms is it? Well, I've got grams, I've got the mass of atoms, and I want to get to the number of atoms, not the moles. Well, you got to go through Moleville again. So if you want to get there, so all roads lead to Moleville. You can convert between moles and atoms and moles and grams, but if you want to convert between grams and atoms, you got to go through moles. And so in this case, we take our 24 grams, we put grams of carbon on top, we'd put mole, I'm sorry, on bottom, moles of carbon on top, and one mole is 12 grams. That's the molar mass. So. And then from there, we take our one mole of carbon on bottom is equivalent to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms. And now we get from moles of carbon to carbon atoms. And so in this case, 24 divided by 12 is two moles and two moles would be two times Avogadro's number, which once again would be that 1.204 times 10 to the 24th carbon atoms. Cool. So again, one example again of all roads leading to Moleville. So if you want to go from grams to atoms or atoms to grams, you got to go through moles. All right, the next series of questions all deal with the fact that you've got 196 grams of H2SO4, that is sulfuric acid. And the next three questions, so the first one says, how many moles of sulfuric acid do you have? Well, right now you have grams, you wanna to get to moles. There is a way to go to straight to moles. And the connection between grams and moles is always that molar mass right off the periodic table. So if we look at kind of the molar mass here, so hydrogen's got a molar mass of one. And again, all these are right near a whole number. So I'm just gonna round to the nearest whole number. So two times one is two. Sulfur's got a molar mass of 32 grams. So, and oxygen's got a molar mass of 16 grams, but times four would be 64. Well, 64 plus 32 is 96, plus the two more would be 98 grams per mole. And so in this case, we'll put grams of H2SO4 on bottom, moles of H2SO4 on top, so that the units cancel. And again, your molar mass is always the mass of one mole. And in this case, it's 98 grams per mole and 196 divided by 98. I made the numbers nice and this comes out to exactly two moles of H2SO4. So nothing different from what we've done, just with a little bit bigger numbers and things of a sort, but analogous to what we've covered so far. 
But now here's where things are gonna get a little bit different. So next one is how many oxygen atoms are in the sample? Let's map this out. We wanna end up with oxygen atoms. How do you get to atoms? Well, the only thing so far we've learned that allows us to you know, figure out how many atoms there are is moles. And so if we're gonna get to oxygen atoms, we're gonna have to first get some moles of oxygen to get there. Well, do we know moles of oxygen? Well, no, we don't know moles of oxygen, but we do, because we already calculated it, know moles of H2SO4. And we got there originally from grams of H2SO4. And I wanna focus on this step right here. Converting of moles of one thing to moles of something else involves what's called a mole to mole ratio. So these are super important. This is how you convert from moles of one thing to moles of anything else. And these mole to mole ratios come in a couple of different places. And the first place they come from is the formula of a compound. So in one molecule of H2SO4, there are two hydrogen atoms, one sulfur atom, four oxygen atoms. But instead of looking at it molecule by molecule, you can actually look at it as mole by mole as well. In an entire mole of H2SO4 molecules, there are two moles of hydrogen, one mole of sulfur, and four moles of oxygen atoms. It's a mole to mole to mole ratio. I could say that in a sample of H2SO4, there are two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of sulfur. That's a mole to mole ratio. I could say that there's two moles of hydrogen for every four moles of oxygen. That's a mole to mole ratio. I could say that there are four moles of oxygen for every one mole of the entire formula, for every one mole of H2SO4, and that's the relevant one right here, because I'm relating moles of H2SO4 to moles of oxygen, getting it right out of that formula, H2SO4. Let's make that four look a little cleaner. Uh, I don't know if I did the job there. All right. All right, so in this case, if we didn't already hadn't converted grams to moles, well, we do, that's where we'd start. But in this case, I'm gonna start with that two moles of H2SO4, because we've already done that part of the calculation. So two moles of H2SO4, and we'll convert from, again, moles, of H2SO4 to moles of oxygen. And in this case, that mole to mole ratio, we said that one mole of H2SO4 has four moles of oxygen atoms. And that gets us to moles of oxygen atoms. But we wanna not just talk about moles of oxygen atoms, we wanna end up with talking about the actual absolute number of oxygen atoms themselves. And again, the relationship between moles and the actual numerical quantity of something is always Avogadro's number. So now we'll put moles of oxygen on top. We'll put oxygen atom, I'm sorry, on bottom, oxygen atoms on top, and one mole is always Avogadro's number of whatever you're talking about. Okay, and from here, we've got two times four is eight, and eight times Avogadro's number, eight times six is 48, eight times 0.02 is 0.16, and again, times 10 to the 23rd, oxygen, atoms and if you wanted proper scientific notation you'd move that back one and you get 4.816 times 10 to the 24th oxygen atoms so once again we're providing the fact that we've got 196 grams of h2so4 but this last question on the section is dealing with how many grams of hydrogen so how many grams of hydrogen so, and if we look at this, we want to look and say, well, how do I get here? Well, the only thing we know how to turn into grams of hydrogen is moles of hydrogen. So you can convert to and from moles of anything, right? So in this case, grams of hydrogen, I've got to go through moles of hydrogen. So to get some moles of hydrogen, well, I'd get there from, in this case, moles of H2SO4. And that once again would require another mole to mole ratio right out of the formula and then we get to moles of h2so4 from the grams which essentially again we did at the beginning and we'll just keep using that so i'm going to start right here again at two moles of h2so4 so and then to get to moles of hydrogen i need that mole to mole ratio we'll put moles of hydrogen on top moles of H2SO4 on bottom. And I can see that in one H2SO4 formula, there are two moles of H atoms. So that's where that comes from. And then finally we can convert moles to grams. So, and your connection between moles and grams, again, is right off the periodic table, that's your molar mass. And for hydrogen, it's convenient. One mole weighs 1.01 grams. I'll just round it to one gram, since it's right near a whole number. 
And so in this case, two times two, and the rest, everything else is ones, gets me four grams of hydrogen. Cool. So we're going to move on from this context to talk about this in the context of chemical reactions, which is really where the term stoichiometry comes from. Now, in the last lesson in this chapter, we'll move on to learning that we can also get these mole to mole ratios from the coefficients in a balanced reaction. But this is the first place you learn. You get them right from, uh, you know, the ratios within that formula. And we'll find out that, you know, these are all mole ratios. In H2SO4, there are two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of sulfur for every four moles of oxygen. And that's going to be significant in the next section. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share. One of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you've got questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Now, if you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, or if you're looking for practice problems, so check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.